everyone is counting the days until the opening of the great New York World's Fair, an exposition symbolized by the unisphere that dominates the grounds. While we may be counting the days, the workmen are counting the hours, for many buildings are yet to be completed. However, fair officials are confident that everything will be in readiness when the gates finally open to an expected 70 million visitors. Most craftsmen are working round the clock to complete the work on time. And the job is tremendous when you figure that there will be 196 exhibitors rolling out those red carpets. Fifty-eight nations are to be represented from the African nations to the Vatican, and they will have on display many priceless treasures. The theme of the fair is peace through understanding, and its aim is the fostering of mutual and lasting respect and the furtherance of common interests and world peace. Each nation will reveal a corner of itself. For a moment, you can be in the Far East, and then a step away in Europe. The fair covers 646 acres and is on the same site as the 1939 World's Fair. It will run for six months this year, close for the winter, and reopen the following spring for six months more. When you come, prepare to spend some time. There'll be plenty to see, plenty. Meanwhile, doff your hat to the workmen who are striving to beat that deadline. What is now a sea of mud will be rolling lawns. What looks like a jumble of metal and wood will be a sleek pavilion. The New York World's Fair of 1964 promises something for everyone. They have bet a billion dollar investment and five years of planning. See you at the fair. For the first time in nearly 30 years, a child movie star is immortalized at Grauman's Chinese Theater, a Hollywood landmark. The teenage star being honored is Haley Mills, daughter of John Mills, who has scored her latest hit in the film version of The Chalk Garden. Now Haley joins the ranks of Hollywood greats who have left their hand and footprints in the sidewalk before the theater. A big honor for a little girl. Tokyo is dressed in her holiday best for the opening of the 18th Modern Olympics, the first to be held in the Far East. At the National Stadium, there's a capacity crowd of 75,000 present for the opening ceremonies that precede 20 different sports events among athletes from 94 nations. The United States contingent of 330 men and girls is warmly applauded, and the male members are singled out by their jaunty western hats. The Russians follow the U.S. team, their arch rivals in Olympic competition. There are 5,541 entrants in this year's games, a near record. As the host nation, the Japanese enter last. The Japanese have spent $2 billion to welcome their guests, and not a taxpayer has complained out loud. Then the teams line up on the infield as Emperor Hirohito declares the games officially open. As the 124th Emperor of Japan welcomes everyone to the Olympiad, the ringed flag is raised. Then the spotlight shifts to Yoshinori Sakai, who circles the track carrying the torch that was lit at the Olympic site in Greece and drawn here by a relay of thousands of runners. He mounts 154 steps to the pedestal that holds the Olympic cauldron. Sakai was born 40 miles from Hiroshima on the day the U.S. dropped the atomic bomb. He might stand as a symbol of peace among nations through friendly competition, just as the roaring Olympic flame brightens international horizons every four years. 8,000 pigeons are released to blacken the sky in majestic flight. May all nations find greater understanding through sports. You have to be faster than a jet to keep up with the new American fashions like this narrow coat. But stop off with us in Rome while we attempt to keep you posted. Countless tourists have made wishes at the Trevi Fountain. But what gal could wish for more than this sunny yellow and earth tone wool tweed? It features the closer to the body shaping. Hmm, it certainly does shape up. 
Rome's ancient statues have rarely looked on anything lovelier. Rose red and orange, spongy worsted in a two-piece houndstooth dress. The authentic American look, all wool and a yard wide. She looks over the Roman forum in a worsted whipcord sleeveless shift. This shows the trend towards smoother tuck fabrics. What does she see among the ghosts of Roman senators? This vibrant at home naked wool chalet in a floral print. Where the ancients praised Caesar, she praises the inspiration of its designer. Out of the past and into your future comes this news. And the news is pleats, knife pleats for a mobile moving skirt. The closer to the body look for flattering at home wear. In these days of high fashion, wool now places this hallmark on fashions that stay in the forefront of dreams and desires. What is created on paper comes to life under skillful hands, as witness this long dinner suit in white worsted. It's a daytime fashion now allowed out in the evening, as suits become a part of the after dark scene. What could better complement romance on a balcony in Rome than this black wool crepe cocktail dress to attract that certain man? If you put it to a vote, you'd find the eyes have it. torch is about to be extinguished in a blaze of glory by the U.S. track team. In the 400-meter relay, the American quartet is off to a flying start as Cole Drayton runs the first leg. The U.S. holds both the present Olympic and world records in this event, but both marks go by the board today. It's Jerry Ashworth running the second leg, and he passes the baton to Dick Stebbins, who is off on the third 100-meter lap. Then Stebbins passes to Bob Hayes and watch that man take off. Hayes, left, literally flies down the track as he heads for the wire to make it 39 seconds flat for the U.S. <laughs> Hayes and company contribute brilliantly to the U.S. gold medal total of 36. It's a popular victory. The 18th Modern Olympics is then brought to a close in moving ceremonies that ring down the curtain in Olympic Stadium. In contrast to the formal entry on opening day, the teams mingle together in an atmosphere of exuberance and regret. Not until 1968 will there be another meeting like this one. Olympic torch is extinguished, not to brighten the horizons of international sportsmanship until it is relit in Mexico City. An honor guard carries the Olympic banner from the stadium as 200 torches make a jeweled circle of friendship as the Japanese word for farewell goes up on the scoreboard. So it's sayonara to the first Olympic Games to be held in the Far East Hasta la vista in Mexico. story Saturn 1 stands on its pad at Cape Kennedy, poised to send Pegasus 2 into orbit. The world's most powerful rocket lights up the landscape as it generates its million and a half pounds of thrust. The Pegasus 2 follows a twin into orbit. Pegasus 1 and 2 are measuring the density of meteoroids. This is important data to have collated before we send our astronauts far out into space, much further than the current project, Gemini 1.
Animation shows how the Pegasus goes through its paces once the hydrogen-powered second stage puts it into orbit, an orbit ranging from 316 to 460 miles high. When the satellite is comfortably in place, it goes into action on its own to thrust out wing-like panels to a span of 96 feet. These will measure the damage tiny meteoroids might cause as they hit a spacecraft with sandblast effect while they speed through the reaches of outer space. President Charles de Gaulle makes a five-day tour of France through four departments, and he makes it under stringent security provisions. Ever since he assumed power, de Gaulle has walked in the shadow of assassins. The extremist groups that railed against the settlement in Algeria have stalked de Gaulle since he was elected president in 1958. As this tour was drawing to a close, 11 extremists were rounded up by his security forces, including two high police officers responsible for his safety. De Gaulle shrugs off these attempts on his life with Gallic fatalism, though he does take the precaution of surrounding himself with bodyguards. 4,000 men were on duty during his short tour. At saint gilles he finds time to greet the fishermen just like an old-time campaigner. This is not supposed to be a political trip, but de Gaulle faces a coming election, and it pays to get around a bit. Homage is paid to the legendary Georges Clemenceau as saint hermine The tiger, as it was called, is a de Gaulle hero. In a score of speeches he made during the five days, de Gaulle unfailingly attacked the world leadership of the U.S. and the Soviet Union in the West and the East. He wants France in the foreground as the power in Europe. The 75-year-old de Gaulle has not yet announced his candidacy for re-election with a coyness that hardly befits his years. However, if he fails to run, it would be like a Frenchman giving up his beloved wine for soda pop. Impossible. Some added punch for Uncle Sam in South Vietnam. At Bayonne, New Jersey, four 82-foot Coast Guard cutters are loaded aboard a cargo ship to sail for duty against the communist Viet Cong. The 63-ton vessels will be used for coastal and river operations in the areas of South Vietnam, where the North Vietnamese have been smuggling arms to the Viet Cong. Speedy and maneuverable, the cutters have been refitted and their armaments increased. They will form a barrier along the coast to prevent the landing of Chinese arms in remote coves and isolated beaches. They will be the new policemen on the beat. Once the helicopter was looked upon as a slow but reliable workhorse. No more. At Oxnard, California, they unveiled new refinements on the Army Lockheed XH-51A. The craft goes aloft with test pilot Donald Segner at the controls for this first public demonstration. In one recent flight, the same pilot flew the chopper at an incredible 272 miles an hour. Today, he sort of loafs. In a couple of zooming runs, Segner sends the copter along at a mere 240 miles an hour. It's the beginning of another new era in aviation. The Chelsea Flower Show on the grounds of the Royal Hospital in London is the largest in the world, they say. And each year, it is a monument to man's ability to predict nature. The Horticultural Society managed to have the blooms at their loveliest, no matter the weather, for visitors like Princess Margaret. Queen Elizabeth was... One of the leading figures of our time is dead. Bernard Baruch, whose favorite office in later years was a park bench, was a quiet philanthropist who gave away the millions he accumulated as a financier and Wall Street broker. He was appointed by President Truman to the Atomic Energy Commission. And at one of the early meetings of the United Nations, he came to make an impassioned plea for all nations to ban nuclear weapons as a means of war. He addressed the Security Council with his now famous statement. We are here to make a choice between the quick and the dead. That is our business. His plan was not adopted, but he was ever the advisor to presidents. 
President-elect Eisenhower and Prime Minister Churchill met in his New York apartment to renew a wartime friendship. From President Wilson to President Kennedy, he was a frequent caller at the White House, where his advice was sought in many areas of international concern. He was honored as few men are in their own lifetimes. A housing development in New York City was named for the man who devoted most of his life to public service. He was a man esteemed by all of his countrymen. The Russians scored a propaganda coup at the International Air Show in Paris, but the U.S. came right back by showing two aces. President Johnson's plane arrives at Le Bourget Airport with Vice President Humphrey and astronauts McDivitt and White aboard. The space twins were asked to make the trip by the president in an obvious move to offset the Russian display at the show. The Soviets had flown in the world's largest plane, a craft that had caught the attention of the crowds. Now, however, the presence of the Gemini twins is causing plenty of comment, and they steal the show at the French Air Industry Association luncheon. On hand is Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, and he is engulfed by autograph seekers, but so are the Americans. McDivitt comments that this is harder work than piloting Gemini 4 around the world. The Gemini twins came, saw, and conquered at the Paris Air Show. A second barrage of tornadoes. The tension in the Middle East over the Gulf of Aqaba blockade develops into full-scale war, with reports of heavy fighting between Israeli and Egyptian forces along the Gaza Strip and the Sinai border. Earlier, the U.S. aircraft carrier Intrepid steamed through the Suez Canal, although no American units are alerted. Our State Department says we are neutral in word, thought, and deed. Earlier, a mass rally in Cairo by Arab socialists shows support for UAR President Nasser, who meets with King Hussein of Jordan to sign a five-year mutual defense pact. The signing annoys Syria, to whom Jordan recently closed her borders. Formerly, Hussein was moderate toward Israel. Jordanian trucks and tanks roar through the desert as each side accuses the other of attacking first. Despite two reported air raid attempts, Jerusalem is relatively calm. Israeli Chief of Staff General Yitzhak Rabin visits and inspects troops in the Negev Desert near the Egyptian border. A UN ceasefire request is supported by the US, while Russia accuses America and Britain of encouraging Israel to attack. Aviation history at Le Bourget Airport as two U.S. Air Force helicopters arrive, completing the first non-stop transatlantic flight by chopper. The copters carried crews of five men each from Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. They flew the same route used by Charles Lindbergh 40 years ago and refueled in the air several times. They made it in less than 30 hours. Another first at the Paris Air Show, the world's largest jetliner, the Douglas DC-861. The $9 million giant flew non-stop Washington to Paris in 12 hours. It's nearly 190 feet long, weighs over 160 tons, and can carry as many as 251 passengers. New milestone in air travel. Alleged dissatisfaction with the welfare system causes riots in the ghetto district of Boston's Roxbury section. Stores were smashed, burned, and looted in three nights of violence. An angry mob estimated at 1,000 persons marched through the streets throwing rocks and bottles at police, setting buildings on fire. It's Boston's first full-scale riot since the start of national racial tension. Police were not the only target for hoodlums. One rooftop sniper wounded a fireman while he fought the flames. Over 40 persons were arrested. They'll be arraigned following a cooling off period. Boston's Mayor Collins called an emergency meeting with Negro leaders. Uneasy calm follows. An 
entire village is evacuated in the demilitarized zone which separates North and South Vietnam. Some 3,000 people prepare for relocation in a new area south of the embattled border region. Marines ordered the move when the fighting endangered civilians. The DMZ has long been a haven for Viet Cong guerrillas preparing to infiltrate the south. Surrounding hills provided added cover. New homes for the refugees far removed from the shooting. Here, the resettled families will pick up the threads of their daily lives. U.S. and Allied military forces have repeatedly moved civilians from battle danger to prevent loss of life. Red China, seen from the island of Quimoy, where close watch is kept on communist mainland activities. Under red guns, free Chinese troops, man underground facilities, even radio stations. The psychological war's best weapon, giant plastic balloons, able to carry up to 40 pounds, bring leaflets and messages of encouragement to fellow Chinese on the mainland. Less than two miles away, they can rise to 40,000 feet, travel up to 12 hours. Medical supplies, books, food, and other daily necessities are also balloon lifted to Red China from Quimoy, called a cork in the red bottle. The Beiping regime hates and fears the sight of these balloons. One town's answer to the anti-Vietnam War demonstrations. It's a Support Our Men in Vietnam rally organized by high school senior Paul Christopher. And it draws 25,000 people. Christopher said he was happy with the turnout, which almost equaled the town's total population. He urged more such demonstrations by youth throughout the nation. And the crowd roared its approval with some vigorous flag waving. World's Fair ever, Expo 67, the international twin island wonderland is ready for its gala opening ceremonies. Host Canada is among 62 nations who have built 100 pavilions on the 1,000 acre site of entertainment and education. The lighting of a permanent torch is part of inauguration day ceremonies. The multi-million dollar fair is spread over two man-made islands in the St. Lawrence River. Premier Lester Pearson, in pre-opening formalities, touches off the torch, symbolic of the spirit of Expo. The fair marks the 100th anniversary of Canada. It will run for six months. Canadian Air Force jets roar overhead, saluting the opening, while 7,000 guests watch from the ground. It's expected that some 35 million people will come to the exposition. Spectacular fountains, curving, sweeping towers and minarets, majestic waterfalls combine in a feast for the eye. For sightseers, there are plenty of sights to see. The universal exhibits symbolize more than just beautiful buildings. They constitute the most modern advances in art, science, and culture. The amusement area has everything to help the visitor relax, have fun, and enjoy himself. Traditional rewards of any fair. The U.S. Pavilion has a built-in mini rail train, a meeting place of peoples, promoting mutual respect and understanding. Expo. Six-day Middle East war echoes along a second front, the diplomatic struggle at the United Nations Security Council. A series of emotionally charged meetings keeps delegates debating on nearly around-the-clock basis. Syrian Ambassador George Tomei charges Israel with continued ceasefire violations, saying that Israeli tank forces advanced toward a branch of the Jordan River to establish control of a strategically important water resource. He calls it systematic invasion. Soviet delegate Nikolai Fedorenko heaps abuse and lashing invective on both Israel and the United States. In a blistering filibuster, Russia breaks diplomatic relations with Israel and threatens sanctions. Israeli ambassador Gideon Raphael answers the truce violation charges, 
saying that his nation's troop and tank movements occurred before the ceasefire went into effect. Israeli government officers announced their victory wipes out previous armistice agreements and frontiers. And that victory is a swift, smashing, and total one, as crack Air Force, infantry, artillery, and tank corps combine to sweep across the Sinai Peninsula to the Suez Canal, east into Jordan, north into Syria. Thousands of prisoners are taken, while Jordan announces she lost 15,000 troops in the sudden and devastating campaign. Israeli spearheads race to the Gaza Strip, advance across the entire Sinai, taking Sharm el-Sheikh at the mouth of the Gulf of Aqaba, thus breaking the blockade. The old city of Jerusalem is captured, as well as Bethlehem, the west bank of the Jordan, and the drive into Syria stops just short of Damascus. Israel reports close to 700 of their troops killed, over 2,500 wounded. Egypt and Syria announce no casualty figures. Heavy air raids dealt the first stunning blow to UAR forces along the Gaza. A furious follow-up came from artillery, tanks, and foot soldiers. Thus, the main Egyptian force was cut off by the speedy armored columns. It's almost a repeat of the 1956 Israeli victory, but with a shorter timetable. The efficient, well-trained Israeli army completely demoralizes troops of the Palestine Liberation Army of Egypt. Egyptians had no support from the air. Their air force was crushed on the ground by low-flying Israeli jets which swooped in from the Mediterranean, avoiding radar, destroying over 400 aircraft. The disastrous defeat prompts President Nasser's resignation, which is not accepted by his people. UAR commander General Munam Abdul Husseini meets with Israeli military leaders to surrender unconditionally, ending the fighting in the Gaza Strip. Nearly 600 Egyptian tanks were destroyed. While the Gaza campaign is ended, three other Israeli spearheads rush toward the Suez. Israel leaders call it the total destruction of Egypt's Sinai forces. An Egyptian military shakeup follows the crushing defeat. Eleven senior commanders resign or retire. New leaders vow to restore the old boundaries. The battle for Bethlehem is brief, bloody, and decisive. Some 40 Jordanian defenders were killed, the remainder fled. Israeli troops moved in behind tanks, while care was exercised toward all religious shrines. The Church of the Nativity was untouched. Civilians soon joined Israeli troops in the street, and the town where the Prince of Peace was born quickly returned to normal. Without doubt, the most personally moving moment for Israeli troops was the capture of the old city of Jerusalem, the location of an ancient Jewish holy place revered by the Israelis. The fighting over, thousands of joyous civilians, students, and troops streamed toward the Mandelbaum gates. It's the first time in 19 years that Jews have been allowed to visit and pray at the site of the ancient Temple of Solomon. Jordan had kept the old city barricaded since the declaration of Israeli independence. It was here that Israeli troops acted more like tourists than fighting men, obviously in awe of their surroundings. The sacred Wailing Wall, where Israeli Defense Minister General Moshe Dayan prays, pledging never to give up the old city. While Russia and other Iron Curtain countries label Israel's victory as aggression, insisting she pull back to original boundaries, Israeli Premier Eshko, equally adamant, insists Israel alone will determine her swallowing. Anti-war demonstrators protest U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War in mass marches, rallies, and demonstrations. Central Park is the starting point for the parade to the U.N. building. The estimated 125,000 Manhattan marchers include students, housewives, beatnik poets, doctors, businessmen, teachers, priests, and nuns. Makeup and costumes were bizarre. Before the parade, mass draft card burning was urged. Demonstrators claimed 200 cards were burned, but no accurate count could be determined. Reporters and onlookers were jostled away on purpose. Although mostly peaceful, shouted confrontations were frequent and fiery during the course of the march. The anti-war marchers were picketed by anti-anti-war marchers who were hawkish toward the parading doves.
Civil rights leader Martin Luther King leads the procession to the United Nations where he urges UN pressure to force the US to stop bombing North Vietnam. Police arrested five persons as disorderly. Three were grabbed when they rushed the parade float. No serious injuries, however, in New York's biggest anti-war march. A companion peace demonstration brings out 50,000 marchers in downtown San Francisco. They parade two miles along Market Street, pacifists and hippies together. Gigantic Kizar Stadium holds the mass rally where anti-war songs and speeches trigger a short scuffle between pro and con factions. No one was injured. Both demonstrations were sponsored by a loose coalition of left-wing, pacifist, and moderate anti-war groups. President Johnson, meanwhile, let it be known that the FBI is closely watching all anti-war activity. In Rome, a peace demonstration ironically erupts into violence near the U.S. Embassy along the glamorous Via Veneto. Police, alerted to possible trouble, stopped the marchers just short of their goal, and then the march turned into a riot. Peace placards, cafe chairs, and fists flew in all directions. The next phase, a sit-down protest, but Rome police and firemen, too, had a solution. The solution, H2O, applied freely and under high pressure by the Rome Fire Brigade. The strong water jets bowled over demonstrators one after another. They dried out in the pokey. It took police one hour to break up the mob. 33 rioters were arrested. Internal drama in the eternal city.